You don't want to crawl. You want to fly. And advancements in modern data science makes flying very possible. Though some companies are still doing things the old-fashioned ways, you don't have to be one of them. Join Eric Cavanaugh as he interviews Peggy Sai from Big ID, Nadine Francis from the Toronto Star, and Scott Taylor, known as the Data Whisperer. The future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed. Yet, today's world teams with innovation. The nexus of hardware, software, and human ingenuity promises a revolution in possibilities. What does tomorrow look like? Witness Future Proof. Yours truly, Eric Cavanaugh. We're going to talk all about modern data management today. So crawl, walk, run, fly. What does that mean? We've got several experts lined up to tell you all about it, what their thoughts are. Scott Taylor, the so-called data whisperer, is online today. We also have Nadine Francis, the Toronto Star, and Peggy Sai of a company called Big ID. And in the background, we've got Daniel Overdeer, AKA Daikayo Data, who will be live tweeting. I just saw her and Scott, as a matter of fact, at the Airside event in New York City that was an absolute blast. We talked all about governance and really about modern data management. And Scott, you were there real quick. What were your impressions about uh, the gig, the air side, the whole thing? For Eric, thanks for having me back again. Love being here on DM Radio. Scott Taylor, Data Whisperer. Spoiler alert for all you out there. I don't do a lot of whispering. We say that for the data. <laughs> but it was a blast going to JFK, that iconic terminal, that TWA terminal of my youth flying 707s when I was a kid walking through those big long red tubes and then we got to go to that uh, event outside on the tarmac in the in that right. old airplane it was it, it was just a blast also there was some fun stuff about data going on there too but that's I was right. just that's enamored right. with the environment and I tell people all the time that invite me to these great conferences and I'm always thankful that I'm primarily there for the cocktail receptions at the beginning of the event, at the end of the event, that's the fun part. But you get to talk to people and talk about what they're doing in their lives. And I'm sure data weaves its way into the conversation at some point. Uh, and we're, we're surrounded by data these days. And so like the topic today, crawl, walk, run, fly. My take real quick is that crawling is you're doing basic stuff. You're pulling data out of some system. You're in a flat file. You're loading it into Excel and doing some machinations there. If you're walking, well, you're probably getting a bit more sophisticated. You're setting up some scripts, maybe to pull data automatically. Classic ETL, extract, transform, load. So you extract it from the source system, you transform it into the, the format that the schema will match in your target system. That takes some work, I've done it. I've been doing it for 25, almost 30 years, honestly, uh, in different fashions, but mostly with uh, marketing data, emails, name, first name, last name, all that fun stuff, loading these files in. And then you get into the running phase. Well, that gets a bit more interesting. So you're probably trying something called ELT, where you extract and then you load, usually in the cloud, and then you do your transform in there. Because guess what? The cloud has a lot of capacity, compute capacity, but also you don't have to strip out the context anymore. We used to always strip out the context because we kind of had to, because we had to fit the data through thin pipes to reach slow processors and expensive storage. And all that has changed. So ELT, you're kind of running and then flying. That's what I say is some of these really cool vendors are doing now with dynamic data pipelines. Companies like Ascend, companies like DataOps.Live who are at the Airside event doing really cool things about setting up dynamic connectors between systems so that all the boring stuff is just done automatically. The automation stuff, and, and that's what gets me excited Scott, and I think you too, when you think about the business people in our industry, they don't want to have to care if it's ETL, is it ELT, or using Java, or, you know, who cares? As long as it gets done and they can use it, that's the point, right, Scott? They absolutely do not care about ELT, reverse ELT. I ran auto AI with reverse ELT, and now my data is running backwards in circles. So I, I don't really know how that works. But from a business side, I think fly is you're able to deliver the right content in the right place, the right time in the right context to, to, to move the business forward. And I think of crawling, not from a technical perspective, as you mentioned on kind of what you do with the data, but the data quality, the data confidence itself. Do you have those foundational elements in place around the most important domains that are that run your business, particularly 
brand data and relationship data. When I say relationships, it could be customer, vendor, partner, prospect, consumer, all those different types of relationships you have. Is that stuff well managed? Did you get to a point where you can kind of walk that around? Are you running with it in a way that your your hierarchies tie out, your reports tie out? And then Fly is really putting all that stuff into the business. So I think there's another stream of this kind of crawl, walk, run, fly terminology about business value and business accessibility and business trust in the data. Right. That's a great point. And I just had uh, a thought in my mind to run with a metaphor. Sometimes people run with scissors in their hands, right? It's like, whoa, don't <laughs> yes. go running with the scissors in your hands. All right, be careful with that PII, personally identifiable information. The regulations are, are, are really everywhere these days. If you're in California, certainly you got CCPA. When you, you're in uh, Europe, you've got the GDPR. And uh, big companies that are not careful about their data, that don't button down the processes. And guess what, folks? Automation is one of the best things you can do, especially if you can unwind it, right? I mean, you have to be careful about what you automate, but most most mistakes are made by people who are just not paying attention or uh, got distracted or whatever the case may be. It's usually human error that causes trouble, right, Scott? A really good way to screw up your brand is to release data you shouldn't be releasing, is to not conform to the privacy regulations and it gets harder and harder, but we've, heard story after story in the last years about brands really exposing themselves and damaging their relationships because they didn't protect and guard and steward that data in the ways that they should. Right. That's exactly right. Well, let's bring in our next guest here and stick around, uh, Scott, for the roundtables. Nadine Francis with the Toronto Star. She was uh, invited by our good friend, Danielle. So Nadine, thanks for joining the show. And tell us a bit about yourself you. and, and your work and your journey in the data world. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Uh, thanks for having me, Eric. Um, so my uh, data journey is kind of is a uh, probably a little different than uh, many other people. I'm a project manager now um, with Torstar, which is um, the um, which is the major company that owns Toronto Star and uh, six other um, daily newspapers and over seventy community newspapers and um, various other power brands. So we are very well known in Ontario, Canada. And at one point about five years ago, our, our um, CEO decided we needed to become a data company. We still weren't even selling subscriptions online. Um, everyone was siloed into different things. And as you were mentioning, we were definitely crawling. I don't even know if we were even crawling yet. Like we were, I think we were just on our backs <laughs> going like this. Uh, every department was kind of doing their own thing. A lot of errors, Every, you know, everyone had different numbers. It was uh, a bit of a mess. Um, and at the time I was a research um, analyst, um, so we, we thought we were automating, you know, because we had spreadsheets and we would create our own reports and send them out and nice little PowerPoint presentations. And we thought we were the bee's knees. And um, eventually we brought in a, um, a chief data officer and he decided to um, inherit the research team who actually knew how to analyze data. We just didn't have automated data yet. And then he brought in other people who knew how to build the infrastructure. So we started from the ground up and he decided to build the foundation of what we require to um, build a subscription model that was, we could automate, we could report on and also incorporate, make sure every team across the, across the company was actually working with the same information. So, at, in the midst of that, I was very interested in project management for many years and they needed a project manager. So I decided to get my feet wet in that and have been learning ever since. So well, uh, it's been a very, very interesting uh, journey. Good good for you. And uh, I know from experience, folks, project management is, uh, is for serious professionals, right? Because you have to kind of map out the project, you have to know the desired end state. That's some of the best consulting I've come across is when people talk about desired outcomes, right? What do you want to be the yes. case when we're done with this project? Is it yes. a faster time to reporting? 
Is it improve customer experience? When you have very specific goals, that makes your job a heck of a lot easier, right, Nate? Yeah, and what's been interesting is seeing the progression of how our, our company has been thinking about data because originally they didn't have that mind, data mindset. So before it was like, okay, what do you want? And they'd be like, I don't know, I just want a report. And now they're actually thinking more strategically about what they want to present and what they're going to use the data for. Um, so we, it took, um, there were certain departments that didn't want to buy in at all. Um, and now they're major advocates of data. Um, so it's been a very, it's been really fascinating to see the progression of um, buy-in and uh, acceptance of uh, using data management. Yeah, that's great. It's wonderful that uh, you have buy-in, and that's a fantastic sign that people who were a bit skittish up front or standoffish have come around. And you know, the key, you mentioned it a couple times, is that you're all using the same data. So you're on the same page, yes. and you can build some processes around that. And I loved your quote, we thought we were automating because we had spreadsheets. <laughs> you're not alone, you know, that's, uh, that's not uncommon. But once you figure out the automation because let's face it there's a lot of grunt work that goes into doing good analysis yeah. and uh who who likes grunt work i've done etl it's not a fun thing to do it's just something that has to get done so if you can automate that process and have the audit trail that's the best case scenario right nadine absolutely and um what i love about our team is we do have like we kind of we've kind of created three streams for ourselves we have the engineering group they, they're very focused on the governance, the privacy, um, security, um, also all the ETLs. And then we have our machine learning group and the people who do the visualization. And then we have where I used to work, which was the research and analysis group. Um, and so they just review a lot of this information, making sure that everyone is understands what they're looking at and uh so that they so that our stakeholders can make sure they're you know making proper decisions and so it's been it's been really fun so yeah well well good for you and in the newspaper business i mean you folks have come along pretty far pretty quickly if five six years ago you weren't even doing online news and that is a radically different industry now than it was 10 years ago for sure absolutely uh, five right so absolutely yeah are you seeing that your job and what you're doing is really helping the organization identify how to do that better and what services to offer and how to do things? I think we're still, I think we're still in the, I think we've left the honeymoon phase now. We were very excited about just getting subscriptions um, and getting that lifted off. And now we're trying, now we're spending a lot more time trying to understand the churn and make, and, um, and uh, so we're trying to, I think that's the, the key now. So we're, we were flying for a few years and now we kind of moved back to the running part, I would say. We kind of, you know, we're taking a breath and then I, I feel like we're moving to another phase. Uh, we're just kind of taking a few breathers here. So we're just running along kind of that leisurely jog and then we're going to start running again by the end of the year so we kind of know where we want to go um and you know with covid a lot of things kind of uh slowed things down so now we have we're just trying to reconfirm our direction so yeah that i mean that makes a lot of sense to me and maybe i'll bring in scott uh, taylor just to comment on that to me that sounds like a a, a mature organization that got some things done and is now regrouping a bit to figure out what to do next. You got to do that a lot these days, Scott, right? It's happened. And, you know, COVID actually accelerated a lot of data management activities and a lot of organizations that were thrust into, let's say, e-commerce and they weren't prepared yet. And they realized all they had was operational product data that they couldn't put on a site in front of possible consumers. And so there was a lot of the analysts that I talked to said that their inquiries around data governance, data stewardship, data man master data management, my favorite topic, just increased 20, 30, sometimes 40%. So I feel like we're kind of broke through in a lot of cases because that space, which is where I live and what I love, and that's the only way you start crawling is if you get that MDM right, you get that master data right, is finally, I think, getting its day in a lot of organizations that were just distracted by the sexy BI, AI, data science stuff. Sure. And, yeah. it, you know, you, you, I, 
what I like about the title of this of this session is it is in that order, right? You don't you, if you start the if you, if you want to try and fly before you can actually walk, you're going to be in trouble unless you're a bird, <laughs> I guess. But really, is that order? It's not uh, it's not something where people can skip steps. I guess there's right. a pun in there without <laughs> being able to to do that work. Talking with several experts today, including my good buddy Scott Taylor, the data whisperer, who doesn't whisper much. That's just his moniker. And we've got Nadine Francis, kind enough to join us from the Toronto Star up in Canada. She says it's not cold today. That's a good sign. I'm in Pittsburgh, south of her, and it is cold. So I'm a little tired of the cold. But uh, we have Peggy Sai coming up next, actually, from a company called Big ID. Very, very cool company doing some fantastic work that I think is uh, much needed in the business. So, Peggy, tell us a bit about yourself and your company and how you're helping companies go from crawl to walk to run to fly with their data. Thanks, Eric, for having me today. It's great to be here with um, Scott and Nadine. So I'm the chief data officer for Big ID. We are a AI machine learning data discovery platform. So what we do is the ability to automatically connect to all your unstructured, structured, cloud, on-prem, basically all types of data sources and data types that you may have um, on your premise or that the organization owns and automatically be able to understand um, what those data assets are, be able to classify it and get those data insights in place, right? So what we're able to do is for organizations to build out their catalog, which is an inventory of all the information they own, build out a business glossary, which is what I call the semantic or logical layer of um, the business terms, and then be able to do specific applications on top of that um, at range from privacy, um, DSAR compliance, um, privacy impact assessments to security, um, and then to my favorite topic, which is data governance. So stewarding and um, uh, data quality and we're looking into data lineage and how we're really helping um, customers uh, accelerate their data management program is that we're doing a lot of things automatically for them you know we take a data driven up approach um, a lot of um, data governance tools out there rely on a top-down approach like almost like a curation process a manual creation process to understand and document what all their data assets are but we do it from uh, the opposite direction, right? Looking directly at the data, be able to um, provide what we think are the, the, the business attributes and just have it validated by the data stewards. And we also provide cool insights, like what are the duplications and similarities across your data silos. And we'll be able to identify things like what your data quality outliers are. And ultimately the purpose here is do things faster and better with machine learning um, together with the data steward. Hmm. That, that sounds fantastic. And you know, in the pre-call, we were talking about Big ID and, and what you're working on. You said something that got me very excited. Uh, you, you talked about how when you deploy, typically teams from across the company will work with you to analyze the data, to classify the data, to look as you suggest for data lineage. And you mentioned the data governance teams, the security people, and also the analytics folks. And that's fantastic news because I got to tell you folks, most of the time in large organizations and even small mid-sized companies, you would have completely separate groups focused on these different tasks, certainly for security. But we're now seeing security and governance, even data governance, becoming much more intertwined, which is the way it should be because it's typically the data you're trying to protect. I mean, the systems as well. Sometimes hackers come in and you, know, you do ransomware, things of that nature, but you're, you're protecting the data and the systems. And why wouldn't that be a collaborative effort? So I think you folks are really onto something and I, I'm glad that the industry seems to kind of figure this out. But is that your impression too, that we're, we're moving in the positive direction of more collaboration and less uh, discrete silos of, of processing and, and teams and so forth? What do you think? Absolutely. I see it. Um, especially in the last couple of years um, that I joined Big ID, a lot of um, convergence and overlaps between um, data teams and privacy teams, as well as with security teams. And really you need all three at least to be, and plus legal compliance and risk right. to be working with us. But we don't, in any organization, you don't want to be, be building three different data catalogs, three different right. processes of identifying sensitive and confidential information 
And that's where data governance has problems, right? Because your um, reports, your external um, uh, reports and analysis is going to show three different um, answers because depending on who you're asking. But if you have consistency um, and one single source of truth, I would say at the very beginning, um, then it would be a, really a, a big benefit. Um, now I see data governance teams owning privacy compliance. I also see security teams owning data governance as well as a function. So, you know, these type of organizational uh, hierarchies are really dependent on the culture of the organization, but um, any type of overlaps and collaboration amongst those three, I think is, is a great uh, step forward. Yeah, and if you can agree to work from the same data set, <clears throat> then that solves one huge problem. And I think the end result is you wind up having much more meaningful conversations instead of debating over what the number is, you can talk about why the number is that way and what we can do about it. And that's where the business value comes. I mean, we talked earlier about automation and really the more of this stuff you can automate, the better, because once it's automated, then you can start seeing the big picture of what's really happening. And you can start taking some actions. If it's not automated, you're spending all day doing manual, tedious, grunt work that is very bad on morale and doesn't have a lot of value to the business. So people wind up getting burned out. We're in the middle of this great resignation right now. I will bet you that a significant portion, if not even as much as half of people who are walking away from jobs are doing that because there are too many manual processes, boring things that people don't want to do. What do you think, Peggy? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think a lot of the, the automation that I'm talking about, especially in data management, are the repetitive ones that can be automated through rules. So a lot of the cleansing and the mat data matching that Scott mentioned earlier. And I think there's a big misconception about having um, one single source of truth. And I just want to clarify that for the audience, Eric. And the people think that if you only have one single source of truth, then everything has to be equalized and standardized across the organization. That's true to some extent, but I think a good architecture will allow for differences in finance having one definition, the legal team having one definition. You, you want to enable as well as your different lines of business to work with one single source of truth, but also be able to define things that the that is important to them and in their way. And you have to recognize that there can be uh, multiple ways of defining things, of calculating metrics or what people uh, consider like customer last billing date could be different from the marketing team versus the actual billing team. So in order to accommodate for that, you need the single source of truth to be able to um, have that flexibility in defining things. And if you make that a very flexible agile architecture, you're going to be able to accommodate um, all the variations um, and be able to be able to flex with the data management needs in your organization. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And you also mentioned focusing on lineage. So just to explain to our audience out there, lineage means where did this data come from? Did it come from a third party? Did it come from our customer database, for example, where it came from, when it came from, who touched it along the way. These are all critical data points for data governance, right? If you don't know those things, you don't really have a lot of data governance, right? But the, the key, I think, is to learn from that process. So when you nail lineage, you'll find out, hmm, the data we keep getting from this one system seems to be off, why is that? You start looking into it, you figure out, oh, there's a filter in place, or oh, we forgot to map this field. I mean, there are all kinds of little steps that can be mistaken along the way that have error propagation spinning up down the road, causing all kinds of issues. So to, you know, to have teams really focused on that, and the key again is to have this sort of marshalling area, because if, if you're managing different definitions in multiple places, that's gonna be very challenging especially for new people, but it's going to be challenging for the team to, to understand what things really mean, right, Peggy? No, absolutely. Um, all my customers talk to me about data lineage, right? As, and as you said, our um, lineage is important because are you creating a report? Are you doing your analysis from the authoritative source, right? And then also understanding the impact analysis, right? If, if the source data changes, 
um, what else needs to be changed. And that actually takes up the most amount of time in terms of having conversations, meetings, or emails, just to understand if you change the format, the data type of one cell, oh my goodness, what other types <laughs> of reports will be impacted by that That's because right. it's not gonna show the same amount of decimal places. Uh, so that really is a real world example in, in terms of where not just data quality, but from a data lineage perspective. And there's two types of, um, when, I, when I think about data lineage, it's lineage from a business process perspective and also a technical data lineage. So it's really important to understand um, you know, when you're when I'm speaking to to someone, what exactly they mean by data lineage, um, and really the challenges of data lineage is that there's so much data, first of all, and then second of all, data is stored in so many different environments. You're talking about your QA, all your non-production environments, your test environments, and your production environments, and then all the reports, dashboards, uh, applications that can that propagate that data, right? So being able to create that extensive spider web of where data moves and how it transforms across the organization is so challenging. And then this is where the fly comes in, right? I think the run and fly, this is where you do need automation to kind of um, understand and be able to help predict directionality of data um, and not rely on people like myself in the past who literally had to just document in a visio diagram where data is and it's time right. consuming, it gets outdated really quickly, do it That's once right. for an audit and then one month later it's um, outdated. Um, so you're gonna have to redo it again. And do you really wanna be spinning your wheels and spending all your time documenting? Right. You, no, you wanna no. do fun stuff in data governance, so. That's right, that's such an excellent point. We have a great point from uh, someone in our studio audience here who writes that uh, people are walking away from jobs because governance and security teams can't agree on strategies as well. And, and that leads to frustration. I talk all the time about the importance of morale in organizations and I, I believe when, when a person is charged with a particular responsibility and they feel they have the tools, they have the equipment, they have the data that they need, and they can get the job done, that's very rewarding. People like that. People like knowing that they're getting things done. I think it's a pretty small percentage of people who really want to cause mischief. The problem is that uh, a lot of times you don't have the tools. And, and kind of to one of your points, Peggy, and I'll throw this to you and then maybe over to Nadine and Scott, we're really getting somewhere with issues like impact analysis. So if you have the right technologies, you can look into, you can load the, the platform, whatever you, you're using and say, okay, what if I change this field? You'll be able to see where you're gonna impact people downstream. Typically, how is that gonna change things downstream? Oh, you get alerts, that's gonna break this report, it's gonna cause trouble here, et cetera. That helps people understand the big picture of how this all weaves together, right? Because it's very easy to lose the forest for the trees. Uh, it's also easy to just get lost in the in the forest sometimes. But I think, Peggy, I'll throw it back to you real quick. This ability to do impact analysis is very powerful, and we're finally there. What do you think? I hope we're finally there. I mean, certainly I've been doing it for the last 10 years on impact analysis, and there's certainly a lot of tools and um, new ways of leveraging machine learning, right? Where looking at large sets of data, being able to um, understand the data, looking at and having machines look at the data values itself um, and be doing some, improving the way I think data lineage can be um, expanded today. Um, and one area that I think is really fascinating, and this is completely green field here, is um, lineage on um, your unstructured data. Um, it's something that actually uh, most organizations um, have not considered because lineage for the most part is ETLs and looking at ETL transformations, which is structured and will be on your relational databases um, and possibly um, on your cloud environments as well, understanding that lineage, but um, being able to see where it actually lands in your unstructured data and has it actually changed values. So there's a lot of correlation between um, lineage and data quality and you know, it all kind of um, weaves in together, but ultimately, at the end of the day, yes, that's what a data steward, your business analyst, wants to understand quickly, and that's where organizations, as I said earlier, spend a lot of their time spinning their wheels, not really understanding the, the full impact of changes in their data tables or 
technology, iPad technology team suddenly create a new schema table and everything had to be redirected, right? So um, lots of things can, can happen and that's where having a good understanding of a strong data governance program with lineage is, is so important for any organization regardless of size or industry.